Um, all right, so we're going to get rolling here. Uh, this is my friend. I've known Dave since, uh, believe it or not, 1989. Don't we look good for our, like, our really There old we go. <laughs> <laughs> Dave and I actually were loan officers in Colorado. And uh, I always like to remind him I beat him, but he beats me at everything else going forward. <laughs> so here we go. So I want to introduce my friend Dave Stevens, Fairway's friend Dave Stevens. He's helped us so much oh jake is here jake jump on with us really quick I was combing my hair just so <laughs> haircut were you <laughs> oh, so, um, any commentary before i do my my introduction of our, our buddy dave stevens no just i want to just share i think everybody knows this to be true this is nothing um special or a, a big announcement but in the 24 and a half years of fairway would argue with anyone to say we've ever had a better consultant helping us uh, one of the, you know, there's always silver linings in every year because there always is. And this year, one of the silver linings is, um, is Dave Stevens helping us. And we've already said to Dave, depending on you know, his schedule, what he's doing, we want to re-up for next year. We could not be more grateful and thankful for his insight, his wisdom, and just his, his quiet, humble discipline with us, um, nudging us sometimes and helping us always. And we couldn't be more thankful to have David helping us. So with that being said. Thanks, Jake your intro and roll. Well, good to be we go. with everybody. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what I want to start with. It's not the best picture that I have up here for those of you who are watching, but um, this is a, the Roosevelt room. It's the conference room across from the Oval Office in the White House. And uh, I often tell this story because we're about to go through a regime change in, in Washington, which is going to mean a lot to our industry. Um, so uh, this is the president's conference room. You can see Barack Obama with his back to us uh, in the in the chair there. I'm the guy on the caddy corner uh, on the table uh, with the blue tie, uh, and I still had some black in my hair back in the day, um, doing something I'm sure extremely important. But we've got at, at this meeting. You can't see him. Tim Geithner was there, and David Plouffe, and Bill Daly, and Jack Lou and all these key players who made decisions. But I, I remember these meetings because the first time uh, I was called to the White House was about uh, two weeks after I'd been confirmed by the Senate to be the federal housing commissioner. And we were in a housing crisis. So the president met all the time uh, with, with folks like us. And, um, uh, and so the, the, Reality was when I, on my very first meeting, I walk into the room and there's couches along the back and, you know, I'm about to meet with the president and everybody at the table has a PhD uh, in finance from Yale or Harvard or somewhere. Uh, and here I am with my political science degree from the University of Colorado, go bus, and, uh, and about 30 years of industry experience. Um, so I walk into the room, I immediately go to, to sit at the couches in the back. Tim Geithner, who was the Treasury Secretary, looks at me and he goes, you're Stevens, right? And I go, yeah. And he says, I want you at the table. So I sat at the table and uh, in walks the president. Uh, and like every meeting I had with him, which was every couple of weeks, he had read everything, was a voracious appetite for information. Uh, he immediately starts off to me and says, look, I've read everything. I only have one question. What's a warehouse line? Can someone please explain that? So here it is, 2009. Um, I, I actually got the call from uh, the, the, the White House to consider joining the team uh, in March, uh, just a, a, a few short weeks actually after the president was sworn in. Um, and so I'm walking into this group and I'm looking around the table and I'm going, you know, Yale, Harvard, MIT, you know, here I am. And the president's asking a question, the room is silent. Uh, Tim Geithner looks down the table and says, Stevens, answer the question. So my intro to Washington was realizing that while there's a lot of depth and really smart people who come into administrations, what we do can oftentimes be very esoteric. And these roles uh, that are happening right now are going to make a difference. And I, I hearken all of you to think about Mark Calabria, who's the head of the FHFA, um, and the Fed governor, both of whom uh, have taken steps since the COVID pandemic began that could have completely taken down companies in this industry. The buying up the mortgage-backed securities in March, creating this massive short, blowing up hedge positions, threatening the cash flows, the liquidity of a whole bunch of lenders across the country, unforeseen. And it's because they, didn't, they hadn't thought about this sector. 
when the CARES Act was passed and went into effect April 1, the forbearance plan was put into place. No thought about liquidity and who's going to make advances to MBS holders uh, on behalf of servicers. And so, um, and I think the director, I still say to this day, made a terrible mistake not backing up the industry, um, throwing in 500 point basis point delivery fees and then pulling back and making it easier and then 50 basis point fees for refis. All of this stuff makes a difference. And so I, 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 I'm going to talk about the political uh, landscape uh, very briefly here uh, today because you got a lot of other great people talking about the markets. So unlike the usual slide presentation I give to the team, um, I'm going to leave that for the other guys. And I really am looking forward to hearing what Mike Fratt and Tony in particular has to say about rates and the market looking forward, because uh, I think he may be slightly different than uh, some of the others. It'll be interesting to hear. Um, so let's kick this off. The first thing all you guys need to realize is hey, I hey, think- one, one question, we got 42 people asking the same question. In that Roosevelt room, is your name still on that one chair? Is that what? The, is that the way it goes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, I will tell you, I went into that room and um, you'd be amazed at who was at those table meetings all, all, often because the, the group varied. Uh, but I sat in that seat the entire time that I, that I uh, had meetings with the president. And uh, people call me from our business, Brian Chappelle, who's uh, a well-known uh, consultant in DC, will always call me and say, you know, no FHA commissioner ever spent that much time with the president. And it's because we had a housing crisis <laughs> that we were sitting there so often with this guy. Um, but it was, it was a unique time. Uh, and Gabe, yes, go buffs. The, um, so let, let's start off with the basics. 2021 and the Biden regime is not uh, 2009 with the Obama regime coming in. And, and I think it's really important for us to recognize this, this difference. In 09, housing was the reason for the nation's economy and the global economy to come the closest to the Great Depression ever in history. Um, the, the, the unsustainable programs and products of, you know, fog the mirror, I think, uh, as, as was referenced earlier, uh, mortgages, subprime, uh, negams with piggybacks on them at deeply discounted teaser rates, uh, Nina, CISA, Fast and Easy, you name it. Um, that brought down the U.S. economy. It brought down 450 financial institutions in just a two-year period uh, went out of business. Countrywide, Wachovia, uh, WAMU. I mean, you can start rattling these guys off. We were the reason for the collapse uh, in the housing finance sector uh, of, of this nation. And so it wasn't a surprise to me uh, to be asked to come in because I knew they needed experts and to see what was going on. I was there when Dodd-Frank was passed. I worked on it uh, with a bunch of other folks from Treasury. Um, and, and to see the regulatory response to an industry that was viewed to be have gone too far uh, was completely not surprising. And it shouldn't be to any of us. So all of the rules that were implemented over those subsequent years were mandated under the Dodd-Frank legislation. The, the ability to repay uh, rule, co the qualified mortgage rule, was implemented because Dodd-Frank called for it. The National Servicing Standards Act, LO compensation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things were implemented. Were they done perfectly? No, that's a different point. But uh, they were done. And, and, I, and, and so what's different now? This economic recession brought on by a pandemic Housing is the bright light of the entire economy. Housing is the good story, not the bad story. We're, we're the ones helping to keep this economy booming it, 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 for the sectors of it that are booming. Um, and so, you know, I, I've walked through a lot of slides that, that talk about that. You've seen plenty today and you're going to see more before it's over. But housing is really the, the, the great story. And uh, what Ivy didn't show you, if you take that 5.9% year over year appreciation rate, uh, for 2019 October to 2020 October, uh, I'll use CoreLogic's data from Frank Notav. It, every region is showing uh, significant gains. Even Las Vegas has like a 5% year over year home price appreciation. Uh, and Vegas is a big service industry market. So you got to wonder what's driving that. I think Ivy alluded to that. We got retirees, a lot of folks buying single family homes that aren't necessarily dependent on the services industry of the casinos in, in Vegas. But nevertheless, we are the story. So as you think about what's gonna happen uh, with the new administration, don't expect the whole slew of new regulations. It's not what they're about. They're gonna be focused on payday lending 
at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They're going to be focused on student loans. And yes, I do think they'll be focused on making sure that borrowers who went into foreclosure uh, during this pandemic or went into forbearance are being treated the way the servicing standards rules apply. But beyond that, again, you got to look at this and say, we are the good story. We're we're the guy. We're the folks who are helping this economy stay strong, and that's that's a really important point to differentiate the really strong credit quality, the the extremely well regulated industry that the mortgage banking industry is today, and the fact that the rules put in place by Dodd Frank around the kinds of programs and products that you can offer today are entirely different than a two twenty eight fog the mirror Nina Sisa combined. Uh, uh, product of the past, and uh, and I and that 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 juxtaposition needs to really uh, keep in mind because uh, you are not going to be the focus of the Biden administration. As a matter of fact, um, what you should expect from the Biden administration is a focus on housing, but their goal is to expand options for home ownership and expand security and safety around rental housing. It's in the president's uh, in the incoming president's own agenda that's on his website. Uh, called Investing in Communities, and it includes a lot of things. Ivy talked about the $15,000 first-time homebuyer tax credit. Yes, that's in the plan. Um, in fact, I've spent a lot of time on calls with folks from the team talking about how do you actually implement a tax credit so you get $15,000 to a borrower uh, at the closing table or as close to it so that they can actually use the money and fund it. And how do you make sure it's really a first-time homebuyer and have all these controls in place? Pretty difficult thing to implement. Um, but there's a focus on housing. I mean, the good news about Biden is that there's that, that this president is coming in. Forget the politics. I don't care what you think about anything else related to the election. As it relates to housing, he's talking housing. He's pro-housing. Uh, and he wants to expand home ownership opportunities. Uh, I agree with Ivy. I think the $15,000 is, is too much stimulus for a tight market. The good news all of you should uh, take from that. Uh, if you agree with the view that that I have and Ivy has and others, is that that probably has a zero percent chance of being uh, legislated. That would require Congress to agree to it. Uh, we're going to have uh, a Congress that's almost split down the middle, regardless of what happens in Georgia. Uh, that'll take. That'll just mean whether uh, we have Mitch McConnell heading the Senate or. Uh, Chuck Schumer's heading the Senate. We will find that out uh, in January. But the, the, the voting tie is so close that you're not going to get through controversial legislation. And a big spending bill for housing is not going to hit the uh, is not going to be considered a need when housing's booming. And frankly, every dollar being spent by Congress has to help those in trouble and impacted by the pandemic. So um, that part is, uh, that, that's a sort of the, the, the scenario. I think we have, uh, in general terms, I think we have a president who's going to come into office with the team, many of whom I've worked with in the past, who understand our issues, uh, understand housing finance. They'll probably, uh, without question, slow this rush to release Fannie and Freddie, which I think is good for our business, because uh, it, it takes away a lot of the risk factors. Um, and uh, their areas of focus are going to be covid rebuilding relationships uh, that they believe were harmed over the past few years uh, with European leaders, uh, looking to rejoin uh, ag agreements that uh, we backed out of, other things completely unrelated uh, to the housing sector, uh, with the exception of helping to protect renters and housing and trying to make sure we get through this pandemic. Let me cover just a couple other spots as it relates to that. Janet Yellen comes in at Treasury. Now, Janet, uh, when I ran the MBA in Washington, I brought members to see uh, Janet Yellen. She's a brilliant woman, uh, extraordinarily uh, capable. Um, she uh, has experience uh, in the White House working at the Council of Economic Advisors, obviously a very strong Fed chairman. She's respected by re Republicans and Democrats. She should be uh, probably the first confirmed cabinet member that comes in. And she understands housing. I've, br I've brought in commercial lenders and residential lenders to meet with her. And she had all the issues. She knew all the things to ask. She understands the balances. She understands stimulus. And she has a great relationship with Powell. Uh, they had a close working relationship before. So we have a Treasury Secretary who's going to be able to hit the ground running, as it were. Uh, but will definitely change course of where Secretary Mnuchin was working with Calabria on GSE reform 
Uh, I believe Janet Yellen will take this in a different direction at the direction of the president uh, in order to slow things down and look at the GSEs more as utilities to help the economy recover from a pandemic rather than two companies that need to be rushed out of conservatorship and given back to shareholders. I think it's just going to be an entirely different perspective. Um, one other, there's three other seats that are important. One is, F, one is HUD, the other is CFPB, the third is FHFA. So let me just cover them quickly and then I'll stop. Um, so HUD, well, uh, we've got Congresswoman Fudge coming into the job. Um, she's not a lightweight guy. She was a, uh, she's a, a very talented attorney. Uh, she was a, a, a uh, she worked for the state. She she ran regulatory agencies in the state. I know people in housing who worked with her in Ohio, uh, and uh, and so I think you know from that standpoint, she is going to be uh, a plus. She's not deeply steeped in housing, so look for who she puts in head, head the FHA. That's going to be really critically important. Important, and the names being discussed are people we all uh, that I know anyway uh, for that role. So we'll look forward to see how that fills out. I don't expect a lot to go on. Um, I, this is going to kill me. Hold on, guys. I'm letting my assistant out the door. Many of you fairway people know my assistant. It's a dog named Chloe. Um, chief, your chief the, morale officer. Yes. <laughs> my chief morale officer. Uh, so that, that's how uh, they're going to focus on uh, bringing back the affirmatively furthering for housing rule, which was an anti-discrimination rule, which Secretary Carson took down. But there's not going to be any big significant impacts negative uh, to what we do for a living. And so I just expect that to continue going on. And hopefully they continue with the modern, modernization efforts that Brian Montgomery has been pursuing. Uh, the CFPB. So Kathy Craninger, uh, she's out. Uh, it, it's not even a question in my mind. She's going to be out fairly quickly. Um, you know, look, that, that agency, the, the, the CFPB was created as an idea that began with, with Elizabeth Warren. Uh, the Democrats feel a great ownership to that bureau, uh, and they're going to want their own person in, and they, have, they don't have high regard for some of the steps that Kathy has taken. Uh, and so you should expect a change there. They can do that now because the Supreme Court ruled that a single director that can't be terminated uh, except for cause is unconstitutional. And so now the president can fire that person at will. So either Kathy will leave on her own, or the president will take care of it one way or the other, Fairly into the early into the new term, I think, because Elizabeth Warren's going to demand it. And he's since he's not giving Elizabeth a cabinet role or a prominent role other than retaining her Senate seat and being a voice from the Senate, um, that that'll be the nod that he, you, he definitely Dave, has an obligation. Who do you obligation. think's going to go into that role? Their names being discussed, uh, Sarah. I it's going to be, uh, uh, I think, someone with pretty strong legal and regulatory oversight chops. Um, and uh, someone with a progressive lean, it'll be a difficult confirmation. Uh, so uh, that may be drawn out um, uh, fairly to, for a longer period of time. One of the things that we had to consider for this whole new government is unlike Trump when he came in and he had a strong majority in the Senate uh, to get his confer conferees through uh, and they all went through very quickly or unlike uh, Obama, when he had a Democratic majority, got all his confirmations done pretty quickly, uh, this is gonna be a much more difficult one, particularly if the Republicans hold the Senate. Uh, and some may think that's a good thing and you all may have different views there, but it is, uh, even, even with a small majority, you're not gonna get through extremists into any of these roles. I, I view Biden as very much of a centrist. Uh, he wasn't the progressive's choice in the Democratic party uh, to be their candidate. Uh, He'll be getting a lot of harassment, I think, from the Bernie Sanders AOC wing of the party for not being strong enough in certain areas. Uh, but whoever he picks for the CFPB is going to have to be someone who can be confirmed by the Senate. Uh, yeah. And that's going to mean they can't be too extreme. Um, <laughs> nice so dodge that's on the bureau. name, though. That was a good dodge on the name. Good job there. Yeah, yeah. You, must, be, the you must have been in politics. <laughs> All right, keep rolling. <laughs> OK, and then let's let's go to the last one. Um, and uh that's the CF. That's the FHFA. Uh, so Mark Calabria is a, a, in a different situation than Kathy Craninger. The Supreme Court ruling in, uh, on the case, uh, the Sela case, was specifically about the CFPB and determined that uh, that director can be t uh, uh, terminated at the will of the president. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the legal stuff about it as to why that's different than the FHA, but there's a slight difference in terms of their authorities. Uh, that the that the Supreme Court case may not 
endorse with the FHFA. So Biden's coming in. The last thing he wants to do is get in a war with Mark Calabria. He's uh, he's a chosen young a chosen son from the Senate Banking Committee. He worked on the Hill on the Senate Banking Committee on the Republican side for Senator Shelby. He was in the the leadership staff there for, for many many years. He's uh, a highly regarded conservative, uh, and so for a president to come in and terminate him, you're picking a you're picking a fight with the conservatives on the Senate Banking Committee. That's the last thing you need to do. Uh, Biden wants to worry about COVID. He wants to worry about some global issues. Uh, in terms of relationships with uh, certain foreign countries. Uh, Iran, uh, he wants to uh, reinforce uh, concerns there, et cetera. Whatever his list is going to be, he'd like not to have it be a big housing battle. Uh, I know we all think housing is the most important thing. I can assure you in this administration, it's not going to be, which is a good thing, frankly, for us. So uh, Mark probably stays at least until the Supreme Court comes back with their ruling from a case they heard uh, just a week ago, just a, a several days ago, they heard two cases, the Collins versus Mnuchin. They're both from two circuit courts. But one of the cases is constitutional. The other statutory. The constitutional case challenges the single directorship again as to whether it's constitutional. Uh, I, we expect that ruling to come back likely near June of next year. And so by June of next year, if the Supreme Court rules like they did with the CFPB, that that role is, uh, is not constitutional if it requires cause to be terminated, then the president can fire him and move on to pick Mark Zandi or someone to run the, the FHFA. Um, if, if, uh, if, if the Supreme Court doesn't hold that up, then the president either has to terminate Mark for cause um, or try to use the CFPB case as precedent, which would be pretty difficult because the Supreme Court would have already ruled uh, the other way. So. I think a lot of legal folks are watching this and they expect that the ruling will uh, give the president the authority to fire Mark, in which case we're done with Mark Calabria uh, late summer and a new confirmation starts uh, working its way through for FHFA. The, the bottom line though here is Mark can't get recap and release done like he's trying to do now of Freddie and Fannie without a, compl without a, a, a treasury secretary who agrees with him. So his only hope is between now and January 20th to get as much done as he can with the GSEs. Uh, they're not going to get released. Uh, there is not going to be a consent order by January 20th, at least by virtually anybody's estimate uh, as to what's possible between now and then. I do expect there'll be an amendment to the preferred stock purchase agreement related to how much capital Freddie and Fannie can retain, giving them authority to retain uh, more capital but beyond the even existing cap that was just modified. Um, but it, nothing significant for you guys. So uh, bad news, I think, is that Mark does stay for a while longer. So your 50-bit fee hangs in there. The deliveries fee hang, fees hang in there. He just announced while we've had this meeting this morning, a new liquidity requirement, uh, which we all need to read closer because uh, that, be, that could be concerning to everybody in the business. We just got to see what that says. Uh, Frat and Tony may have already read it by the time he comes on. Maybe he can talk about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, Mark is not bullish for our business, right? He's made it more difficult for all of us as director of the FHFA. Your low interest rates and your booming volume, you can thank Chairman Powell and the Federal Reserve. There, he's, he's the guy who's making this business and housing work and creating opportunity for so many home buyers. Mark's not doing anything in addition to that to help. In fact, uh, in many ways, he's created challenges for us, as we've all dealt with over the year. We got through it. and It's been an awesome year, and that's great. But as we move forward, you know, charging a 50 basis point fee on a program that's actually less risky called a refinance, uh, if you refinance an existing credit to a lower rate and a lower payment, you're actually improving uh, your performance outlook uh, in terms of default risk. There makes no sense charging extra 50 basis points on those loans. It's just purely a, a money grab is, is all the director uh, did in this case. So things like that, I think, can shift, but not until we get a new FHFA director. If I was to put a, an estimate on that, I would say that's probably Q3, Q4-ish mm. uh, kind of Senate confirmation to get a new FHFA director in. So you're going to ride the year with a new capital rule going in place, uh, which he's already announced, which is going to potentially raise G fees. Um, uh, so that this this question of what may happen to rates, I think you have to factor that in uh, beyond just what happens with MBS purchases in the bond market. Um, 
And then uh, likewise, the, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to look at things like second homes, uh, cash outs, which he's already put a limiter on, um, and things that he doesn't view as core uh, to, the, uh, to the charter, to the mission of Fannie and Freddie as he goes forward. So in the end, I'm just going to end with this last thought. Um, you know, this stuff actually matters because you get the wrong people in these jobs. They can cause a lot of trouble uh, to our industry and yeah. worsen opportunities for home ownership for the folks we deal with every day. Um, I think in this case, you got a, you, you have a team coming in that's in a general sense pro housing. Um, I, I know so many of them. I've talked to the head of the transition team at HUD uh, in a fairly lengthy call already in the last couple of weeks, um, who I worked with when she was uh, in the previous administration. Um, I, I'm glad to see at least these folks know the turf, they know the territory. And, uh, and, and that'll be a positive thing in terms of knowing about housing. And I wanna end with this last thought is that what I started with, the good news is 2021 is not 2009. And keep reminding yourself of that. This administration is not coming in with a problem to fix in what we do. We are the light, uh, the shining light of this economy. Uh, they're doing everything possible to actually drive rates lower and get more people into homes uh, and protect them in their housing because that's good for the uh, stabilization and recovery of a post-pandemic uh, economy. And so uh, just don't equate any of that regulatory brain damage we had from 08 uh, all the way through for you know, much of the eight years of the Obama regime as have any semblance of, 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 of relationship to what uh, we're going to see under a Biden regime going forward. Yeah, don't listen to core logic. So I got a question. We got some questions coming in, but I got a question for you because you and <clears throat> sorry guys, I had a power surge and it just blew me out. Anyway, real, uh, you've been on both sides, Dave. You've been realtor, loan officer. Uh, what what you you know? We've got a bunch of realtors on today, and thanks again, guys, for for joining us and a ton of loan officers. What would you tell them they should be doing for 2021? Uh, originating and obviously going back 30, 35 years. What's your advice? <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. The, the, uh, oh, yeah. And for all you realtors, I ran, I was president of the Long and Foster Realtors. That's where I cut off. Discussion. When I, I think yeah. what happened is I was like tooting your horn so loud. it went <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Good, good. Smart internet. Um, so, the, uh, uh, you know, look, I, I'm a, I have great respect for folks like Barry Habib because they, they, they provide, and, and uh, all the folks, HomeBot, et cetera, there are tools in place that can help you bring greater value to the folks that you're dealing with uh, on the front lines. And, you know, for loan officers who have been doing a lot of refinancing, uh, you know, it's a very different thing to be in a reactive selling environment where you're quoting rates and dealing with folks that you may have done loans for in the past and refinancing them to a lower rate. Uh, versus developing a relationship with the realtor, being a valued partner to that realtor in a way that other loan officers cannot be because you bring something to the table that they otherwise don't have. Uh, and then have, pulling the borrower through the realtor, we, I call it a pull through sale because you're not direct, oftentimes directly dealing with the consumer until your referral partner and you collectively together make that decision for that to happen. So um, it is a very different business, and I think there are a, a lot of different tools that can help. I think a lot of these data slides, you know me, I'm a, I'm a data junkie, and I, I often believe the data, because it's independent, it's uh, non-emotional, uh, and the data right now is so positive for home ownership. Yeah. Uh, someone just asked, put in the chat box, you know, what about inventory? Yeah, inventory is such a huge problem, and, and, uh, and as Ivy talked about, it's going to continue to be a problem. Um, but that's good for home price appreciation. And so, well, you know, you can't satisfy every prospective buyer out there. Those that get a home right now, they're coming in with historic low rate opportunity or near historic low rates, depending on when they buy over the next year. And they're going to be pretty well guaranteed home price appreciation going forward because inventory and demographics are wins at their back, uh, is wind at their back in terms of what's going to happen to home ownership. So, for me, I think the best way to run the business, and I always said this to my agents at Long and Foster as well, I think I had 14,000 of them at the peak, was, you know, this is an industry of partnerships, right? I mean, uh, the real estate agent brings very unique skills uh, in, and, and very unique sales abilities and marketing abilities that help motivate a potential home buyer 
to want to buy a home and help guide them in that direction and work with the families and all that windshield time that's required to get someone comfortable to take that next leap. The loan officer is a necessary evil to that process. Uh, Brian Buffini, the real estate trainer, used to uh, talk to me decades ago when I hired him, but he'd draw a mountain and he had a huge spike, uh, the peak of the mountain. He goes, that mountain is the roadblock that the realtor sees between getting that home buyer into the home. And you're the, you're the block, you're the lender, you're the one obstacle to getting that into the home. And it's a really important lesson because our job is to make the realtor look like a uh, king or queen, to do everything possible to provide the tools, communication, follow-up, under-promise, over-deliver. I mean, all the things that we know are critically important to being uh being good at what we do, but it is a partnership and it doesn't happen without either side working together and trusting each other. And that's, that's a whole uh, skill set. But I think the tools that Barry uses uh, as just an example, because I play on his website quite a bit, are, are, are examples. And it's not the only ones because other people are showing uh, great ideas too, but I think they're examples of things you can use to make someone feel even more confident and emboldened to make the decision to go buy that home uh, and do something good for their family. Yeah, we got a little bit of time left. So I'm going to jump in on these questions. Uh, let's go to, do you think with the forbearance situation, it's getting more difficult, right? Right now. Do you think that's yeah. going to lighten up a little bit in 2021 with uh, the new presidency? Yeah. So it's not the new presidency, really. I don't think Biden has anything to do with what happens with the economy. I hate to say this right now, no offense to my friends on the Biden team. The, uh, um, if you heard Chairman Powell, so he, the FOMC spoke yesterday, uh, met yesterday, Chairman Powell came out and gave a fairly lengthy press interview. I'm sure several people who were speaking here today listened to it or watched it. Um, I did. And, uh, you know, he, it's very clear. Powell's going to stay in. They're going to buy 80 billion of treasuries and 40 billion of mortgage-backed securities until we're well out of this mess. That's great for mortgages, great for rates, yeah. uh, is going to keep them low. Um, and uh, that's going to get us through this mess. But the, the more important thing about Powell, which I think surprised a lot of people watching, was he was a little more bullish than people expected. He expects a really strong economic recovery after Q1. He thinks Q1 is going to be really hard, which we should all expect because we can see the COVID numbers and all the sh re-shutdowns, et cetera. 17% um, of all retail businesses in America, or restaurants, excuse me, in America are permanently shut down. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, we're dealing with all of that. We're in the, the center of that storm right now, but we have a vaccine. It's rolling out, it's rolling out faster and it's more effective than anybody uh, could have hoped for. And, uh, and so that's gonna bring back return to employment and we're gonna start seeing job growth in, in a fairly significant way. I, I bet Michael talk about this when he comes on. Um, but, you know, that that was Powell's commentary. So for all of us, we should expect that you're going to get through this winter and realtors both with you still have extraordinary demand and we have still a ton of refinance volume for lenders in general, as well as purchase transactions. It is the winter, which is typically a slower market for us, but it's stronger this winter than most winters in the past. Um, and then we're going to have uh, an economy that's going to be on a much stronger track for GDP growth. Uh, next year, and then leveling out to more normalized rate as we go as it returns back to normal. I'm not going to do those predictions. We have you have a PhD economist coming on here shortly, but um, I'm very bullish, guys. I and I'm I'm very optimistic, more so than I've been in a long, long time, about what it means to be in the business we're in. Whether you're a real estate agent, mortgage lender, we have a demographic uh, in, environment that's entirely different than the Great Recession of 08. Millennials are actually buying homes. Uh, we have a move out of rental into home ownership. Ivy talked about it, but that's clear, pronounced, uh, an excess of inventory multifamily. Um, you know, this is all really good for what we do. Not great for all industries. I'm glad I'm not in uh, commercial or multifamily in the next couple of years. But for you guys, I think you're in a really, really great place to be for this business. Oh, one last thing. Can I just add, Sarah? Oh, yeah. We, you know, you, we, got, you, we, got, some, we got a few minutes, so we're good. You got to think about where you are at Fairway. Um, because, and I've told Jake this, I, I think the independent mortgage banker is the sweet spot uh, of where to be and one that's not beholden to 
Wall Street investors. Uh, so they're independent. They're independent mortgage bankers are very big in this country, but they're beholden to some investor or going public or what have you. I, I think I think the ability to be in, in an IMB that's strong, well managed, good name brand uh, is is the great place to be. Why? Banks are not going to come back to easier credit. They're they're just not. Banks will be a great source for jumbos. Um, and as we all know, even some of the banks with the huge retail sales forces, I worked at one of them, Wells Fargo, the average production of a retail loan officer at a bank is typically less than half of what it is at an IMB. Mike can tell you the exact number. Um, and so you guys are more successful at what you do. It's all you do. You're experts at it. Uh, and you're not beholden to uh, third parties, uh, whether it be bearing down investors or, or Wall Street analysts are going to expect things out of you um, just because we our refinances are declining. So imagine being one of these companies that just went public. Uh, Mike's forecast is I think refis are going to drop about a trillion dollars by the end of next year over this year uh, in total volume. And so you're going to have to be telling your investors and your, and your uh, shareholders that you made less money or you did less volume uh, than the year before. It's, if, if you're an IMB, you don't live that way. Uh, we, independent mortgage banker executives like Jake, uh, have know that, you know, this is a market where we have booms, uh, uh, we have slow periods, we have busts. Uh, we're gonna, these next few years are gonna be really good years, but I think they're gonna be particularly great for the high production, retail focused, traditional independent mortgage banker, not beholden to, you know, unnecessary pressures. And, and you guys are in a pretty sweet spot where you are, I think. We are. And we're so thankful we didn't uh, do that. Yes, we are very thankful. Hey, Nicole, you got a question? I see your Zooms, your sounds off. I do. I do have a question because I uh, absolutely appreciate Dave's input on this. I understand everything that you're saying as far as where the economy is going, the strength of the economy and the low interest rates. And even Ivy was talking about during her session about uh, the impact that we're having on the slower building starts and how 20 to 30 percent of those are being built for rent versus own. What's the answer? Like, what's the the secret answer for inventory? Like, is there uh, a path that you see to getting more inventory online in the next year or two? Well, look at the at the risk of sounding political. So please don't read it this way. I I, I think the 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 what builders need are two things. Um, they need supplies that don't have tariffs uh, that make it too expensive for them to import lumber from places like Canada. That had a big impact. You can talk to any home builder. I don't know. I, I listened to Ivy. I don't think she went down that path, but I'm sure she would talk about it as well. Um, and so you know that's that's been a constraint to being able to build the quantity of homes in the right price range needed uh, to make opportunities for home buyers. And you need cheap labor and plenty of it. And unfortunately, uh, in, unless you can invent some hidden workforce here in the United States, you've got to have a different view about immigration and how people can come into the uh, country to work. I have a good friend here. I'm in Southern Virginia, uh, in a very red part of the state of Virginia. And a contractor is a very good friend. Uh, was complaining because he has a crew of 10 guys. He, he built custom homes here at this lake I'm at. He has a group of 10 guys who have worked for him for decades. They go to Mexico every year back to their families, but they come here every summer. They're incredibly talented artisans who build these really high-end custom homes. He couldn't get them into the country this year. And, uh, and he called me and I was like, you know, well, you're a big supporter of President Trump. You call him. I was being uh, antagonistic, but you know it is a challenge, right? And 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 so the construction business needs um, it needs to be able to get supplies at the cheapest way possible. It needs cheap labor, and then the third leg of the school, which Ivy did talk about, she te teased into. We've got a different environment as it relates to zoning requirements, land use limitations, environmental controls, and more to build housing stock, and so that. The time from land acquisition to uh, occupancy has gotten so extended that the marginal profits of an entry level home are just that much more challenging. So back in our day, Sarah, when we did loans in Denver, you'd have builders put up spec homes in developments everywhere. You could go in, there'd be 10 or 15, 20 
homes all for sale, fully ready to move in. Yeah. Uh, and they did it well in advance now they, to an extreme, unfortunately, back during that period of time. But nevertheless, they could build a lot of spec homes. Today, you don't, it's, it's, it's the entire opposite of that. Um, you're building pre-sale only. There's nobody building spec. Uh, you can't keep up getting supplies in that are affordable enough to be able to build the home within the cost range needed, uh, let alone all the mandates and limitations of the uh, counties, uh, et cetera, across the country. And um, MBA and the home builders uh, and the realtors used to meet and talk about this. And there was you know, questions, what do you do with communities to not say, hey, let's throw out environmental controls because you don't want to go back. That extreme isn't going to happen. But how do you get an understanding that um, this is causing an impact to you know, citizens and their communities' ability to buy homes? And that's the challenge. I think this is why Biden came back with the $15,000 first-time homebuyer tax credit, because that's just the easy way to get there. Throw money at the home buyer and give them a chance to go buy a home. But um, you know, that's, it's a much deeper problem much more complicated, but I do think eliminating the tariffs on, on, on lumber imports particularly will help. Uh, and some changes to the immigration restrictions that are in place now will allow more labor to come in and build homes cheaper. That's, thank you, <clears throat> great answer. So uh, here's, here's I, I just wanna watch you dodge this one, okay? I just wanna watch it. Uh, <laughs> we got this about five times in the chat, Dave. Have you ever thought about going in the Biden administration? Dave, have you been vetted by the committee for Biden? Dave, for president. Dave. Well, there we go. Am I glad I didn't ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to watch you dodge it. Let's see your face. Oh, put your glasses um, on. I see. I see. You know what? Yeah, cheaper labor doesn't always make a good home. I understand that, Julie. Uh, the, the um, you know, the, 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 uh, the one thing I'm gratified with the Biden team is they've got a lot of people they've been reaching out to to put together the best team that they can. They've got limitations like any president coming in in ter terms of who they pick and uh, their IOUs and more. But I, I think so far I've been I've been pretty pleased with uh, the majority of the selections that they're making. The real question is who's at the next level below the cabinet level. Those are the, those are the ones who often make the do the majority of the work, and those are going to be really important roles. Um, but yeah, so there, I, I know yeah. they're vetting a lot of folks. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I like that dodge there. Jake, anything for Dave before we uh, let him take off? It, or you can hang around with us. We love having you. Know, you. I still want to be friends with Dave, so I'm not going to ask that question again, because I think it's a great question. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we want to like, keep we're, Dave. We're like buddies, so we want to, we want to ask the question. That's yeah. Great. There we go. All right. Well, so here's... Dave, where can we find you? And we'll all be at your house by 10 tonight. You're so <laughs> Let's get going. Where can we find yeah, you? There we go. I'm at Smith Mountain Lake in Southern Virginia. Uh, <laughs> probably, there's, there's, probably a view with... of, there's a view of the water if you can see it. Uh, yeah, that looks like a gated community. I don't think we're getting it. <laughs> Dave, Dave. But, it's, uh, but uh, yeah. So I'm David Mountain Lake Consulting. If anybody ever has questions, you can always reach out. Yeah, we're going to have Dave back. We're so excited to get back to our Thursdays. Uh, so hopefully, Dave, unless you're, you know, you're, you you have to go to work at, you know, somewhere in D.C., whatever. Uh, we're going to have you back on January 7th for our Fairway folks. And this was great. This was just great. So, so thank you. And I hope you all listened because after our little lunch break, I got a question for you. And of course, we've got a giveaway. So thank you, Dave. It's great having you, Austin. I'm rolling. Let's do the wave for Dave. We love Dave <laughs> Stevens. Here we go. Thank you for your friendship with Fairway. Uh, personally, thank you for your friendship. Just so grateful for all these years. So thank you, Dave. Amazing. As thank always. you, Dave. Yep. All right, Austin, I'm rolling to you for a minute. Hey, guys. Yeah, so uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody on here, all the Fairway loan officers, um, if you're not in Ignite, uh, wanted to give a quick plug on Ignite, on Ignite Connect. Some of you guys might be asking, what's Ignite Connect? Uh, Ignite Connect is everything that Ignite offers but the physical coach. So if you're looking to kind of just get started and, uh, and don't really want to, you know, jump in with two feet, this could be a really good way for you to get into Ignite. Um, it's only $1.99 a month and corporate is generously paying half of that for you. So you're only in it for $99 a month. Uh, but everything that Ignite includes, we've got a uh, roar tracker, which is kind of like our Fitbit. 
uh, for mortgages, Fitbit to ask you to get 10,000 steps in. This is going to, you're going to put in your goals into the word tracker. It's going to tell you what kind of activities you need to be doing um, to, to hit those goals. There's also a scoreboard on there. It's going to track things like uh, credit polls, applications, closed loans. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Uh, there's a lead tracker. Um, kind of think of it like a basic CRM that is included in Ignite Connect. Um, we do a podcast every Thursday. We should actually ask Dave if he'd be on our podcast. Uh, we do a podcast every do Thursday uh, at 11 Eastern. Um, we're usually getting top producers in, just kind of telling their story. Um, so much fun doing that podcast. Uh, we've got an email chain with about 1,100 people, almost 1,200 people on there. Um, and people are just, you know, LOs are just helping other LOs, right? So people will say, hey, uh, I'm up for LO of my county and everyone had voted for him and that person won. Or, hey, is anyone given a first-time buyer presentation? And they get sent, you know, 17 first-time buyer presentations, right? Um, we also are going to give you access to all of the materials that we've ever done on Ignite. That's all going to be on our website. It's all password protected. You'll get a password to the website uh, once you once you sign up. Uh, we do pop-up calls all the time and webinars all the time on just different stuff, kind of like this, right? Uh, we did one on forbearance when that was popular, on refis when that's popular. And then once COVID is over, we're actually going to start going out to different on-site events. I cannot wait for this, guys. Uh, we hit about 20 different cities or 25 different cities last year, well, pre-COVID, right? Um, and and uh, once uh, once we get the clear, we'll be doing that again. Uh, and then also, uh, last but not least, you're going to get access to all of our social media that's invite only. Uh, lots of lots of good content on the social media stuff as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Austin. And you can yeah. see in the chat where to find us. So uh, fairwayignite.com is our website. And then if you forget everything else, just email me directly and we'll get you rolling. Austin, Nicole, Peter, Ray, one of us will we'll help you out here. So when we come back from the break, Ray, where are you, Ray? Thank you, Austin. Spicy yeah. Lars, let's give him a hand. <laughs> he loves and he loves his new nickname. You all voted on it. Yeah. <laughs> There's that red face. There it is. I bet Renee was excited.